And then it's kind of like paradoxical that people say, well, I'm not going to invest in, in Bitcoin or crypto because I don't understand how it works. But, you know, I think if you were to ask them if they understood the traditional financial system, probably they'd give you an answer that doesn't really suit reality. Hi, and welcome to the Andre Pet Shop podcast. In this episode, we'll take a dive into the modern world of finance. And if you're not into finance, don't worry. I think you will enjoy this one. And I actually think you will need to hear this conversation even more if that's the case. We're gonna talk about cryptocurrencies or digital assets and how Bitcoin is your best bet to protect yourself against inflation. Then we'll talk about what in the world inflation even is exactly and how does it happen. After that, we'll delve into central bank digital currencies and why you don't want anything to do with them. All this and much more with today's guest, Charles Lucian Fried. Charles is a French British software entrepreneur. He co founded Additive Low, which is a leading mechanical engineering simulation software. That's a mouthful. And in a completely unrelated industry, or as we'll soon find out, somewhat related, he founded Unsigned Research, which develops sophisticated algorithmic investment strategies. Charles is a deeply curious person by nature and strives to understand technologies that have the potential to advance humankind. So hi, Charles, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Andre. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, just so people understand your background and where you're coming from, please tell the listeners and myself, what's the company that you're building? What are you launching right now? Or if you've already launched it? Yes. So I guess fundamentally, I'm a software entrepreneur. I see like tremendous opportunity in developing software products. And so having said that, I'm currently working on two companies. The first one is a simulation and optimization software for industrial additive manufacturing, which is another word for 3D printing. And then the second one is in finance. So we're developing some quantitative trading strategies in the digital asset space. So happy to kind of elaborate on both of those. And I know they can sound quite uh, dissimilar, but actually both rely on like complex software systems, which is, I think, what I've gotten pretty good at. I would never have figured or come up with the idea to have somebody on to talk about 3D printing, but let's put a pin <laughs> in that for now and circle back to it. The main topic of this podcast is finance. And you said that you're launching a trading company. So can we go a bit into that? What, what's it about? How is it different? And how did you get into it? Yes, absolutely. So let me contextualize this by saying that I've been in, quite involved in finance for the last 10-ish years. The first period of that, we took some funds from various investors and invested it based on some fundamentals in the digital asset space. And then as we progress, I think we made kind of pretty good return for those investors. But as the industry matured, it was also clear to me that there were some diminishing returns within the digital asset space. And so given my background in software, for me, it was an obvious transition to build algorithmic trading strategies for our investors. And so that company is called Unsigned Research. We're a team of about four or five right now, and it was incorporated only two months ago. And so that company kind of really focuses on relatively low frequency trading strategies that exploits the kind of idiosyncratic uh, nature of the crypto markets. So we have one strategy that is live today, returning approximately 60% annualized, and we have a bunch more in development. So yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about this. I really am. You said you incorporated it only a couple of months ago, but is it already active or are you doing trading on there actively or do you have already a fund launched? Right. Yes. Yeah. So I guess there's like two step to this. The first one is, so the way we're going to interact with our customers is by building software that connects directly to the exchange and that trades on their behalf. And the reason why we do that is because we don't need to have kind of proper fund structure around us. And then as soon as we reach between five and 10 million AUM, which I forecast in the next kind of year or two, then we'll launch a proper fund, which will kind of give us more flexibility in our trading. But yeah, right now we have one strategy in, in kind of like quarantine mode that will be scaling up shortly. So let's dissect some of the worst that I heard just now. So what, yes. what is an AOM? Oh, AOM. Yeah, I'm, I'm throwing tons of stuff. So just to tell me if any doesn't make sense. Uh, yes. So AUM stands for assets under management and okay. it's simply the total dollar amount that our kind of systems manage. Okay. And you mentioned that the fund does low frequency trading. What exactly does it mean and how how is high frequency trading different? Low frequency... Um, 
kind of focuses on trading not so often. So for example, the current strategies that we have trade about once a day. And then when you move into like kind of higher frequency space, then you, you might be trading every second or every minute or that sort of thing. Okay. But I, I think, you know, th there's like a nice trade off where when you trade very infrequently, then it's very much kind of about finance. And then when you trade much more frequency, it gets closer to like computer science and signal processing and, and that sort of stuff. So we're kind of like in the middle of the two here. And you mentioned also idiosyncrasy. How does that exactly translate or can you expand on that a bit? To anyone who's been involved in the crypto markets and who also has experience in traditional finance, they'll find that many of the products have been kind of reinvented from the ground up. And so that is what I mean by idiosyncrasies in the sense that they are kind of very specific things to specific markets. And if you can come to correctly understand those, then you can benefit. I'm just trying to wrap my head around this concept. And I think the best way that I could understand it and the listener could understand this yes. is you kind of explaining what the advantage of trading like this with your methods is as opposed to just somebody looking at charts at home and uh, trying to make up strategies and watching YouTube videos. Yes, <laughs> I think you're right. I, I should actually start there and then move into what we do. But yeah, you know, like fundamentally, we rely on kind of sophisticated uh, data science technique that allows us to identify trends that are kind of long lasting over time. And so when we can understand those, then we develop systems that kind of extract uh, the benefits that we can in order to generate returns. I have a keyword here, diminishing returns in crypto. And I don't actually know how to formulate this question, but it's in regards to your trading strategies. So maybe you can help me out and let's take it uh, this way. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So, so diminishing returns, right? Like crypto has been an asset that has been appreciating about 100% per year for the last 10 years. So to me, it's clear that this is not going to last. And then, you know, when you kind of get algorithms to trade on your behalf, first of all, you kind of take the human aspect out of it, which is quite irrational and also tends to at some point make bad decisions. So when you hand that over to a software, you're kind of pretty sure that there's going to be consistent decision making if you've written the software uh, correctly. And so the ultimate goal here is to generate superior risk adjusted returns. And so that can be basically condensed into a single metric, which is called the Sharpie ratio, which is the amount of return that you get for every unit of risk. And risk here is a pretty well defined term, which refers to volatility. And as you might know, the crypto market's extremely volatile. So on a risk adjusted basis, whilst you have 100% per year, your risk adjusted or Sharpie ratio is actually kind of relatively low compared to what we can get using our trading strategies, which basically intend to minimize the volatility. Yeah, volatility is the keyword here. But I'm going to come back to this because there's a lot to discuss given what days do they and what just recently happened. Yes, but it's been a wild week. Uh, it has. It really has. I'm very emotional. But uh, 100%. Yeah. It, I, I think, uh, you know, th this week will definitely be remembered in the future of, of crypto's history alongside Mt. Gox, Bitcoin Cash, and all those sorts of like pivotal the, moments. Yeah, and I guess a lot of regulation, new regulation is also incoming here. So it's going to be used yes. as an example for a long time. Let's talk about Luna and what's recently happened. My first question is, would your trading strategy, for example, that you are deploying, would you have safeguards against systematic failures like this? Maybe a systematic failure, maybe an attack, but this like downward death spiral that the Terra Luna ecosystem experienced? Yeah, that's a very good question. First of all, risk management is absolutely core to every system that we develop, and I can't emphasize that enough. In the context of Luna, the current strategy that we have is long short, meaning that we go long on assets that go up and short on assets that go down. And so one variant uh, that we have live actually made very significant returns from the downfall of Luna. I guess that a lot of people actually did make money shorting Luna, like on its way down right now. And uh, yeah, it's just for context for the listeners, as I was talking to Charles just before this podcast, the reason that I'm asking is very personal for me because I got completely destroyed with Luna and with what's happening right now. And there's actually a fun story here. Last summer, there was also a dip in crypto market. I think it was June 
or May, May or June, June probably, that it happened. And I remember that I promised myself that I'm always going to keep 33% of my portfolio now in stable coins, which I did successfully. But the problem is that I kept my stable coins in uh, UST, which is the Luna's stable coin, which kind of went down. And the double whammy there was that I was in this complicated DeFi system of LP in the Luna's automated market maker ecosystem. And my coins with my Luna pairings were locked in there. And there was basically nothing I could do as I was watching the my portfolio plummet towards zero and losing everything. It, it's been a painful couple of days, bil been building a lot of mental fortitude, but I guess uh, what my own biggest takeaway here is uh, that crypto is nice to have, but I shouldn't identify with crypto and I should just like focus on building because it's crypto, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely tough times, you know. I, I was also kind of reading some tweets as a reply to that, the founder of Luna, and I, I think many people lost like a substantial amount of their, their net worth. So I think you have to be careful in the crypto markets. And But, you know, I, I think for me, there's also like one aspect that it's really important to diversify, not to yeah. kind of concentrate your, your wealth into a single asset, no matter how safe it might seem at the time. So, yeah, it, it's a tough one here. And that's the lesson as well, like from a personal finance point of view. Because after this has happened, I've seen so many Reddit threads and tweets of people yeah. having attempted to take their lives as a result of this or are contemplating taking their lives or uh, some people have taken their lives. And it's crazy to see that this has such an effect on people. It really happens. Yeah, it, it's a truth. <laughs> yes. So it's that a sad has, truth. But just as a coping mechanism, quick side question before we move on. Do you think it was just a series of unfortunate events or do you think it was an actual attack on the ecosystem? Well, so, I mean, we're in the very early stages of the maturity of these systems. And so I think in either case, whether it was like a fault or an attack, from my standpoint, these systems should resist any attacks whatsoever. In either case, for me, it's it's kind of like a failure of the system. Yeah, I guess it um, doesn't matter because it happened already. Yeah. And I, one thing that I'm not particularly comfortable with as well is the attitude and the kind of slight arrogance of the founder. That that was kind of like off-putting quite early on. Yeah, know? I think that only exacerbated the downward death spiral because yeah. people lost hope in the founder. In, in a moment like this, he could have like from a PR standpoint, taking a huge stand, say that we're going to get this through together, be really supportive and understanding, and uh, then slowly build it up and then be a shining example of like, we went to hell and we came back and we built this and like restored people's faith in the project. I was kind of hoping that would happen as well, maybe hire the hire like a really good PR company. But it it seems to me that this might not be happening because all I've seen from his Twitter, as you said, is arrogance. And mm -hmm. it, it's been just crazy because uh, like a lot of old tweets have resurfaced as well where he mocks people who suggest that this might happen, the exact thing that happened, that this might happen and we're warning against it. And he flat out mocks them and calls them names and says things like, have fun being poor. So <laughs> that's a very charismatic- There's many of those. Did. Yeah. Many. <laughs> So yeah. I think ultimately it was his, let's say, personality that was the death of the project, which is very unfortunate because it was looked on as this shining new example. But also what I heard is that this event was really badly timed, also because before the four pool, which is the pool of four biggest stable coins launched, and in that case, this wouldn't have been possible anymore. And I think the launch was like, in, it's not that far away, actually. Yeah, I, I heard something like that as well. I, I'm not entirely sure on the details, um, but what you're saying sounds very familiar. I guess the takeaway from here is if you're going to make a crypto project and be the CEO of a multi-billion dollar coin, it's best not to be a douchebag and remain humble. Yes. <laughs> So we should I think remaining humble is, is, is a good, uh, good lesson for life in general. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But it's still exciting to see how this recovers. And I try to remain hopeful because I would at least like to get some of my portfolio back. 
Well, I mean, I think you're a very optimistic person in general, and I, I can definitely see how this will just kind of make you a stronger and, and better person. Absolutely. I guess it's just an expensive lesson, but thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes expensive lessons are the most valuable ones. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So moving on, we were actually talking about this last time we were hanging out in Lisbon, that most people have zero financial literacy. And I'm definitely at fault here because given how I got wrecked in crypto right now, but also given my understanding of everything else that's going on in the space, I, I know that I do not understand how money works as well as I would like to understand it. But I'm learning and I'm trying to figure everything out. However, my lack of understanding only further demonstrates that indeed very few people understand how money works actually and how the financial systems work. So let's revisit that conversation. What do you see are the problems that could result from the lack of public's understanding mm -hmm. on how the financial system works? So, you know, I think generally speaking, for me, it just seems completely crazy that most people would work their entire lives to earn money, despite the fact they don't really understand how it works. And what I mean by that is, the fact that you can make simple habits such as saving a little bit of money and investing it in the right place that will have a significant long-term impact on your life and potentially leading to financial freedom. So kind of understanding these basic concepts, I think can lead to a significantly better life. And it's, as I said, it's kind of a shame these things aren't properly taught at school. But then when you're referring to the financial system, obviously it's a very complicated thing. And I don't think many people fully understand it, but you know, at a high level, when you consider that governments are kind of inflating the supply of money, it's important that you basically don't keep your assets in cash, right? Because those depreciate over time. And so therefore, the question is, how do I place my money in order to preserve its value over time? Now, property is a good choice. Equities is also a good choice. Crypto, potentially a good choice, depending on your situation. So inflation is something I want to come back to. I'm marking it down right now to my notes. But listening to podcasts with people like Michael Saylor, for example, for me, it really illustrates that even high level economic experts disagree on how the financial systems work and how we should interpret the data there. And from that, I could only extrapolate that most politicians and most governments and most people don't exactly understand these things either. And that just like trickles down and it's, I guess it's like a parabolic curve that's just like falling off with the understanding. I guess the everyday average person such as myself has like very 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 little understanding of things yeah absolutely and then it's kind of like paradoxical that people say well i'm not going to invest in, in bitcoin or crypto because i don't understand how it works but you know i think if you were to ask them if they understood the traditional financial system probably they'd give you an answer that doesn't really suit reality and i guess in this theme inflation is also the keyword because inflation is what differentiates a lot of crypto assets or like the idea of cryptocurrencies, the idea of decentralized finance from the normal currencies, the fiat currencies, the everyday dollars and euros. So let's actually open this up a bit. What exactly is inflation? What is the nature of inflation? Because there's a number that we're getting, I guess just yesterday, the central bank announced the new deflation numbers, whatever they're called. What exactly does this even mean? And what is inflation and how does inflation actually even happen? Is it just a natural occurrence of the financial system or is it something more nefarious and deliberate? Yeah, well, it's, it's a very, it's a complicated topic, but you know, I, I think as you've mentioned, like most countries are releasing their kind of CPI, which stands for consumer price inflation. And so that is the government's way to measure inflation via a basket of consumer goods. And so I know that in the UK, this figure came at around 7.5%. And so that means that basically, if you have a business and you're generating less profit than seven and a half percent per year, then you're theoretically losing money. And this is what we call real terms, right? And so it basically increases the competition for everyone to actually produce more, faster, better, you know. And then when you kind of go into hyperinflation, which is double digit and above, then things can start to get pretty ugly and completely spiral out of control. And so this kind of leads to the loss of every single asset that one has, which 
is is pretty destructive. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in case of a 10% inflation, for example, if you're keeping your cash stuffed in a mattress, you would be bankrupt within 10 years, or was it even less than that? That sounds about right. Yeah, I think that's a nice way to put it. Another figure that I, I know of is that most fiat currencies have an average lifespan of 40-ish years. And most of the death related to those is due to hyperinflation. So this is not some kind of speculative or like doomsday scenario. This is something that happens regularly to a majority of the population on planet Earth. So it, it is a kind of real systemic threat that you have to consider when you're thinking about preserving your wealth. And I, I should really clarify at this point that when we're talking about mitigating for inflation using digital assets, what I really mean here is through Bitcoin, because as far as I can see, all other crypto assets have a supply that is controlled by uh, central uh, authorities. So I think that's a really important uh, distinction for people who are thinking about investing here uh, long term. And there's still a problem that cryptocurrencies are somewhat correlated to the actual stock market. So we are just waiting and hoping for that correlation to end some point and that cryptos can start taking on a life of their own. But yeah. then in, in terms of inflation, how does inflation actually happen? What exactly is inflation? So inflation is the expansion of the monetary supply. So in layman terms, that is government printing more money, which means there's basically more money than there was yesterday. And so that may have immediate effects, such as what we've seen during COVID. They needed to print a lot of money for like various aids. And now we're kind of seeing the effects of that. But it can also be much more gradual, such as the case in, in other countries. Yeah. And you're being really kind with these words right now. And I'm going to be like the bad <laughs> cop then. The way I understood it and then the way I heard it somewhere is basically it's fraud. It's... Uh, Money theft. fraud, theft, exactly. That inflation is <laughs> theft. Yes, it is. Because if I were to get a magic money printing machine and start printing new dollars and euros in my basement, I would be arrested because money fraud and everything else. But if the government does it, then it's okay because they have the permission to. So essentially, let's say we have a fixed amount of money. So... If I now have uh, 100 euros and the government starts putting way more money into the economy, then that extra money is actually going to start devaluing my 100 euros that I worked hard to earn. So essentially, you can claim that inflation is... Uh, how do you say this? Stealing the time of your population, I think, essentially. Yes, and it's also taking away your own bodily autonomy because this is my body, this is my energy. I'm working for something. I'm putting the energy out there in a sense and I'm getting paid in form of money. So money is energy stored. So I could change my energy for the work I've done, for the value I've put into the system, for something else, goods and services that I want. But if there's a government who controls the money supply in a centralized manner, they can just print more and through that process, devalue my own bodily autonomy and take my life energy, life force from me if you want to like go that route. But ideally, you could make a case for this. And that's why cryptocurrencies, I guess right now only Bitcoin, is actually decentralized. That No one owns it. No one can print more Bitcoins. No one can control any aspect of it. And if you own a Bitcoin, if you put your energy into it, that's yours. It will not devalue because no one can devalue this. I think that's that's definitely a very nice way to put it, you know. And when they're kind of stealing this energy from you, it's going to other places. And one of those other places is funding war. So in that sense, when you're partaking into a financial system with a currency that is being inflated and spent on war, that is you basically saying that you're okay with that. And in some instances, it's for defense, which might be okay. But in other cases, it's for off offense, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I don't particularly feel comfortable about that. Nor should you, and neither do I. But for most people, including myself up until like only some months ago, this is how I thought things are, that it's immutable and that they've always been like this. But when I started looking into history of central banking, history of fiat currencies... 
I I understood that this has been only going on for the last 50 years, let's say, central banking in that sense, that it's an experiment that we're running. And this experiment has failed already many times within this 50 years, like Venezuela, for example, and all these other hyperinflammatory, not hyperinflammatory, <laughs> hyperinflationary <laughs> Hyper examples. Yeah. yeah examples yeah. from the last uh, last couple of decades so so it's crazy that i would th- even think that this is so immutable 1971 is when the dollar went off the the gold standard so gold standard. It, it is indeed a very short period of time yeah we, and, we're kind of figuring out what it looks like yeah and bitcoin has been compared to gold so many times but a lot of people argued and i would even agree with this is that Bitcoin is kind of better than gold because like someone Absolutely. could always crack alchemy or or mine some new gold on a meteor and you have mm-hmm. to haul around big pieces and everything. But Bitcoin is mathematics and I really think it's it's come here to stay. It has survived for 11 years. So I, I do put a lot of faith in it, especially because no one governs it, no one controls it. And I guess in that way, it's also a threat to the governments because... If governments are controlling fiat currencies, the, their own currencies, in a centralized manner, this is giving the governments too much power to do whatever they want. And they have power over everyone who participates in the system. And they can do things like, as you said, fund a war or pass policies that you don't agree with. For sure. Mm. Bitcoin is freedom. And the other benefit of Bitcoin is that it's a trustless system. It just works regardless if you trust other parties or not. But all the other financial systems ultimately are built on trust of you trusting your government, for example. And historically, I guess you would agree that governments are not to be trusted. History has proven out over and over again that governments tend to fail. Yeah. And, you, you know, I've I spent most of my kind of adult years in, in London. And in, in London, we're extremely fortunate to have the oldest financial system in the world. So it's been going for around 260 years. And so, you know, when I've been talking about Bitcoin during all these years to like friends, some of them work in the financial sector, none of them kind of really saw the, the value in it, which is no wonder. But, you know, when you compare that to someone who's kind of been like living in Venezuela, who has a a government that is corrupt, who's inflating the supply, who's confiscating property, then the use case is is much more um, obvious. And as you told me as well, is that 80 percent? 85% of the population, right? Actually, that statement comes from Alex Gladstein. So if your viewers haven't heard about Alex Gladstein, I highly recommend you check him out. He has some very compelling use case for Bitcoin and how it can provide freedom to the world. And so that particular statistics uh, states that 85% of the population on planet Earth is living under either and or an autocratic regime or double digit inflation. So yeah, these are kind of significant, like very bad scenarios where Bitcoin, I I don't want to say it's kind of like the panacea, um, but it can definitely help these individuals escape these regions or live a better life. And it's also crazy that I guess right now already, if I remember the statistics correctly, there are almost 8 billion people on the planet and I think it was about 6 billion already have a cell phone but there's a very small percentage of them who are actually banked to have a bank account the idea has been thrown around a lot already but cryptocurrencies can bank the unbanked and do so very easily 100% yeah 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 and you, you know like fundamentally the prosperity of humankind is a function of the friction around how easily we can transfer assets from point A to B. And what I mean by that is someone who is living in Africa who wants to sell one of the goods that they've produced, it is currently very difficult for them to sell it to someone in the US or in the UK, for example. And so by embracing a network such as Bitcoin, which basically provides access to anyone, as you said, with a cell phone, I think is going to be tremendously empowering for the development of humankind. So I'm extremely excited about that. And it is definitely something I kind of want to play a stronger role within financial inclusion. And so I guess the idea that we're aiming for here, that we're discussing between ourselves and we're trying to get the viewer to understand, is that investing in Bitcoin is basically not even investing just by simply placing at least some amounts of your wealth in 
specifically Bitcoin, not other cryptos, because other cryptos, anything could happen at this point. But into Bitcoin, you can preserve that wealth and it's going to be untouchable and immutable in some sense. And most likely, it seems this way, this is not financial advice, that you might make some, let's say, profits along the way. But the idea is managing your wealth in an anti-inflationary way. I think that, that that's really well framed. And when you come to think of like preserving your wealth over time, what you're really doing is mitigating against uncertainty, right? And mm. so then the question is, what do you trust more? Do you trust mathematics and an algorithmic system? Or do you trust politicians? And for me, well, I guess I'm kind of biased because I'm, I'm a software guy. I, I'm going to go for the algorithm and mathematics. But, you know, as the world kind of becomes increasingly digitized, I think many people will agree with me. So it, in my standpoint, it's a very obvious move here. And most of my wealth is indeed in Bitcoin and all my as assets I now kind of denominate in, in Bitcoin. But yeah, I think, as you said, none of this is financial advice. And like, like a little sidestep here is my own personal criticism as well. What I have observed, uh, you and the viewers may or may not agree with me. But the way I see it is that the politics, at least in my country, are filled with people who have been, let's say, bred to be career politicians or just like fanatics. People that are looking for some sort of glamour. Uh, or like people who are really fanatic about these things. But none of these people are actually inherently talented because I guess the open sector here, the public sector doesn't attract high achievers or good thinkers because the upside is very low and, uh, and it doesn't attract people with strong moral codes either because again, if you want to make money in a moral way, the upside is very low. So you end up with this like pool of people that really shouldn't be in positions of power creating their own little negative feedback loops. This is, this is such a critical point to me anyway. Like the, the way I see the government's, the government entity structured is that there is a deep and intrinsic sense of complacency. And I think that stems within the fact that they can just print more money. And so mm -hmm. why be profitable, right? Which is the very stark contrast between like the capitalistic system where individuals must make best use of their resources and generate profits. So I, I'm seeing that kind of, yeah, pretty pervasively. And coming back full circle here, if top economic experts don't even agree on how inflation works and how the monetary system actually functions and how to interpret the data, how can you expect these politicians to do that? And I guess they're just like swinging whichever way brings the most profit to them personally, what uh, benefits them, because you need the public favor. You don't think long term, you only think short term of yourself and uh, like what you can achieve now in your lifetime in the time that you're in office. And it's it's just catastrophic. So I'm actually really excited to see what Web3 and what the decentralization and like how that might change everything. But understandably, the powers that be don't want to lose their power. So there is a lot of ongoing battles and information battles and everything else and regulatory battles where the centralized powers are trying to still hold on to the power that they have and not lose too much. So do you think that digital assets, and I'm choosing my words very carefully here when saying digital assets instead of cryptocurrencies, do you think that they are the solution to many modern day governance problems that we talked about. And I'm asking this because we've already seen some overreach in large global superpowers. Or uh, will these uh, cryptocurrencies be used against us and they will only accelerate our descent into Orwellian dystopia? And I'm implying, <laughs> uh, talking about CBDCs here, mm -hmm. and maybe you can expand on the term and let's take it from there. Yeah, so CBDCs, uh, central bank digital currencies. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely like a very hot topic at the moment. Most governments are either exploring or actively undertaking their development. I, I guess from their point of view, it, it's kind of a more efficient way to control their money and to allocate them to their citizens. But then, yeah, from like a resident's perspective, it can be quite dystopian, as, as you've mentioned, right? In the sense that, for example, if you haven't be been behaving in the way that they want to, then they might prevent you from buying a train ticket, which means you're kind of, yeah, stuck where you are. 
So I think it definitely has some potentially bad side effects. This ties directly into the show Black Mirror, who's, <laughs> who's seen it. There was an episode where uh, there was a social credit score and people who had a low enough social credit score couldn't spend their money in the ways they wanted to spend it. I mean, it sounds like a conspiracy theory and very dystopian, but this is exactly what's already going on in China. And people are locked mm -hmm. in their regions and they're unable to leave, they're unable to purchase services. And uh, there's camera systems everywhere, all over the place, and seeing what people buy, what they spend their money on, raising and lowering scores based on what they post on social media. And the score gives you access to services, access to schools, access to like everything else. So you're really going to have to be an upstanding citizen and be under this uh, totalitarian control, basically. And uh, the central bank digital currencies are programmable assets which means that the governments can program them to function whichever way they want them to function. As you said, let's say your social credit score falls under 50 points. That means you lose your access to train tickets. Or let's say you wanted to fly over to Estonia to do this podcast in person. But hey, Charles, like last podcast, you criticized the government, so you can't make the flight. Sorry. So th these scenarios... We've seen that in Canada with the truckers. Oh yeah, I guess the president was already set where they used emergency powers to confiscate the funds that people were donating to the truckers, right? Yeah, so it, it's not some kind of um, scenario that I think we're just making up. Th these things are really happening today. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as society, I think it's really important for us to kind of be fair in the way we evaluate things, but also like critical. And also asking ourselves, well, what is the potential of this technology? Should the government change into a different one with different motives, which might be against that of the population? Yeah, and exactly like the way you mentioned Canada, it, it clearly illustrates that this isn't even a faraway problem in China somewhere. This is going on in our own backyard right here. And mm -hmm. it's, it's clearly very biased and prone to political ma manipulation. Because imagine somebody had frozen the bank accounts of uh, Black Lives Matter protesters, for example. What kind of backslash could that have been? But mm -hmm. instead, this was applied to the Canadian truckers. Yeah. So there's definitely politics in play here. And the power that it gives governments is too crazy. But as you said, technology is neutral. Yes, that is, that is my belief. Technology is neutral. It's all about what we make of it. So we've spent quite some time scaring the audience with the horror stories of government overreach. And if somebody now decides that they've had enough and that they want to participate in the decentralization revolution or the process of decentralization of the monetary system, what can they do? What should they do? Is buying and trading Bitcoin the only way? So trading is definitely like it's a real job. And so therefore, I think it kind of requires a lot of training and studying. Having said that, yeah, I don't think trading is the right option for most people. However, if you do want to get involved, I think a good way forward is dollar cost averaging, which involves buying a small amount of uh, Bitcoin on a regular basis. So that could be weekly or uh, monthly and just keeping that up because it basically averages your cost of entry over time, which is a pretty good thing since it kind of ensures that you're not buying right at the top. And I guess it's also a smart move to stick to Bitcoin if you don't understand the crypto market because it's very easy to get lost, scammed or lose all your money. Even in a $55 billion asset, that seems relatively secure, but you can go from $100 to $0.03 within 72 hours, which was unprecedented, but this is just what happened in the last 72 hours. Yeah, it, it can absolutely be brutal. Yeah. But I, I think for, like for the more risk inclined, another good option is to buy in to an index, which is basically like a basket of the top 10 or top 20 cryptocurrencies. Historically, that has kind of yielded pretty good returns as well. But I'm actually now wondering what happened let's say, to a top 10 index right now after Luna crashed? It really depends on how the index was structured, but a mm. pretty typical way is to weight the allocation to any given asset as a proportion to the market cap. So having said that, even at the top, the market cap of Luna relative to Bitcoin was quite small. 
And so I would expect that to have a kind of relatively small impact. But obviously, the whole crypto market is quite significantly down right now. So yeah, you'd be in a drawdown. And yeah, obviously, as we mentioned before, this isn't financial advice. So people need to take responsibility and do their own research, but try not to get scammed by promises of quick riches. But uh, Bitcoin seems to be a safe asset. Bitcoin seems to be an asset that's going to allow you to keep the value of your money, maybe grow your money a bit, and that's going to be anti-inflationary and all those other good things. But also, a lot of big crypto experts I've heard have recommended people to just like buy, let's say, 50% of Bitcoin and 50% of Ethereum, which are the top two digital assets. And this seems to be like solid and balanced advice for most people, I guess. And before we wrap up, something that I promised that we're going to come back to is the 3D printing. This is something that I literally know nothing about and I would love to learn something about the space. So it's a golden opportunity. So Charles, can you please tell me, how did you get into 3D printing and what exactly are you doing in 3D printing? But tell me first, how did you get into 3D printing? Yes, yeah, so well, I, so I've been in the 3D printing space now for around 15 years. I built my first 3D printer when I was around uh, 15 or so years old, so I'm now 30. And so the reason why I got into it is because I was always very interested by how things were made. And when I came across a technology, for me, it was the solution to make any object, which of course is not true, but you can produce pretty much any shape, especially over any other manufacturing types. And so right now I am the CTO and co-founder of a company called uh, Additive Flow, which has developed uh, the leading multi-physics optimization software. And so the USP here, if you wish, is the ability to optimize components using multiple materials uh, or multiple uh, properties. And so this has significant impact on a number of engineering sectors, such as uh, aerospace, medical, and auto, and I'm sure a bunch of others. Basically, we can optimize components to a level of performance that was far above what we previously could. So in a most recent project, we optimized a component, which means it could be manufactured 60% faster. Another example was a 2x increase in sustainability. And so we'd have all these amazing kind of gains that the software provides. And so, yeah, we're kind of now in like a deep commercialization uh, phase where we yeah we have to make sure we kind of leverage this this technology and the software so you basically developed a 3d printer and a software that can print different materials onto the same component and mix the compounds in the way needed am i getting that correctly Yes, yeah, that's a pretty good description. So when you're designing 3D components, you basically use a, a software called CAD, which stands for Computer Edit Design, and it's like a 3D equivalent to Photoshop. And so these initial software were developed in the 1970s um, when 3D printing wasn't around, okay? And so then in the late uh, 1980s-ish, the 3D printers came along, and there you had the ability to change the material throughout the component. And so that required a new type of uh, software, which we've developed today. And as you've said, we have the ability to modulate uh, the material throughout the component. So say you had one part that needs to be kind of mechanically strong on one end and then thermally conductive in the other, we would put uh, steel on one part and then copper, which is conductive on the, on the other. So that's one aspect, that's multi-material, but it breaks down into three parts. So we have multi-material, chemically speaking, then we have meta-material, which is lattices and then we have multi-property which is the same chemical material except that we're going to modulate the microstructure so i've thrown a ton of information there and for anyone who's not familiar in manufacturing this probably made no sense but yeah but i heard aerospace in there so is this like a use case then like who, yes, who, who needs components like this? Yes so aerospace is, is really a big one for us because any small gains that we can give them has significant repercussions on the type of machines uh, that they can build. So, I mean, we've worked with most of the major aerospace companies. And so we recently kind of de delivered a very innovative project on a component that will be on a satellite 46,000 kilometers from wow. planet Earth. Yeah. That's wild. And 
Yeah, I, I can't give too much detail on that, but yeah, you know, it, it's fair to say that the way that they've engineered components so far is, is very different to the kind of engineering that we're proposing. And so there's definitely like a strong element of education that will kind of ensure that the technology reaches its full potential. So you said that you built your first 3D printer, what was it, 10 years ago? So I was 15, 16, which is, I'm now 30. So that's um, 15 years ago. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for me, it was, you know, I, I think you, you you have this this concept of like epiphanies. And for me, that was kind of really one of them where you have like a, a component of like electronics and then software and then mechanical and all these different things are coming together to turn a digital object into a physical world. And I found that so amazing, which is why I've been focusing in that space for, for that time. And from one of our previous conversations, I remember that you started printing these details on your university campus and you were running your first <laughs> business out of your university dorm room. That's right. Yeah. So I had a university dorm and in there I had uh, four printers. And so that's where I started my, my first business. And I can vividly remember one of the customers, which was actually Rolls Royce coming to pick up the parts and being slightly concerned that it came out of a university <laughs> dorm. And, but oh, wow. Thankfully, the components were good and I, I had a happy customer. Can you go into a bit of detail? What did you produce for Rolls Royce? So, yeah, I, 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 um, it, it's hard for me to go in the specifics, but there were components that they were using for measurement. So they had to be relatively precise and well printed, which was definitely a challenge mm -hmm. given that I built these 3D printers with my hands. But yeah, that, that was a good uh, experience. Did you ever get into any trouble? Because you don't have to pay utilities in your dorm. So I guess it's also a good place to mine Bitcoin if anyone's listening. <laughs> yeah, you, you could you could do that. Yeah, uh, for me, you know, the, the main problem I had was sleeping when I had the 3D printers on because back, back in the day, the motors are actually, if they're not programmed correctly or if they get too much voltage, they're really quite loud. And so I had to sleep next to four of them uh, on all the time because obviously I had to kind of meet my orders. So... Yeah, that, that was that was um, a fun adventure. I, I can only uh, wait for the day when you can 3D print your own Lamborghini or something. It's coming, yeah. A multi-material yeah. Lamborghini. I think we're, we're yeah. on the way there. Do you remember those like anti-pirate ads? Like you wouldn't download a car. It's like, I, I would if I <laughs> <Ta -da>. could. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I guess we've covered mostly everything that we wanted to talk about today and i hope the listeners uh, learned something about cryptocurrency inflation or like we piqued your interest enough to go look into this stuff and learn more about it is there any closing comments or asks or notes or anything that you want to add and uh, address the audience with? I mean, I, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. You know, as always, e even outside of the podcast, I always have so much fun speaking with you. Yeah. Likewise. And yeah, <laughs> I really mean it. And, uh, and then in terms of like ask, yeah, I mean, so I think if anyone who's listening found any of the interesting, any of the ideas that I've shared interesting, then please feel free to reach out. I'm always very happy to chat with, with most people. What was the name of the trading fund uh, that you're launching, the trading company? The trading company is called Unsigned Research. And so the website for that is unsigned-research.com. And then my 3D printing company is additiveflow.com. And you can also find me on Twitter at iseeklong. I'm going to add those to the show notes for anyone Thank you. Appreciate wanted it. to reach out and have a look. So... Again, thank you for your time. It's fun. It's always been fun. And uh, yeah, let's do this again soon then. Round two. Sounds good. Absolutely. Whenever you want. <laughs> awesome, Thanks, man. Andre. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. And to everyone else listening, if you enjoyed this podcast, please go ahead and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And also consider signing up to my weekly newsletter on andribetso.com. That's A-N-D-R-I-P-E-E-T-S-O dot com. It's a super simple five bullet point newsletter format that I adapted or stole from Tim Ferriss since I loved that format. And I've been successfully sending out this newsletter every Friday or let's call it every weekend because sometimes it's Saturdays or Sundays for a year and a half now without fail. Okay, maybe one or two fails, but it's getting amazing engagement and amazing open rates and amazing feedback. So I'm happy to keep this going. 
It's just a little something to think about. Let's say brain food or something for your consideration for the weekend. It's five bullets of things that I've been up to or that I'm thinking about or experimenting with. It could be books or podcasts that I'm listening to or articles and podcasts that I've released and soon maybe even videos, who knows. So to sign up for this newsletter, go to andribetso.com. That's my name, A-N-D-R-I-P-E-E-T-S-O.com. I'm going to add it to the show notes if you don't feel like typing it out, along with all the other references from this episode. So I sincerely hope you enjoyed this podcast and uh, see you in the next one.